Welcome to To Know the Love of Christ. Welcome back. If you joined us last week, you know that we kicked off season three in Mark 9, verses 2 through 29, and we talked about Jesus' transfiguration and Peter, James, and John being up on the mount with him and seeing Elijah and Moses. And we also discussed Jesus coming off that spiritual high ride into a conflict between the scribes and his disciples and what that looked like for him. We also briefly discussed the Father's faith and Jesus walking him to that point where he needed to be before he healed his son. As we jump in today, we'll be in chapter 9, verses 30 through 50. So if you would like to pause here and read that passage when you start back, we'll just go ahead and jump into the text. All right, so we see Jesus talking about his resurrection when we start in here, which he briefly alluded to at the beginning of the chapter, where I think it was verse 9 of chapter 9. He charged them not to tell anyone what they had seen until he had risen from the dead. So, I mean, briefly, briefly alluded to it. But he's back there in this passage talking about it first thing. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him, which back at the beginning of the chapter it says that they didn't understand and they were were questioning within themselves what this rising from the dead might mean. Look at what's happened between the two times he said that. So they arrived in Caesarea Philippi, and Peter professed Jesus as the Christ. But then there is this attempted rebuke by Peter of Jesus, you know, that right. showed his unbelief there and in, in what he had said. And then Jesus emphasizes belief in him and to take up your cross, that if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you and you're not part of his kingdom. Then there was a transfiguration. He takes the three of them up there on the mountain and then to enter right straight into chaos with the disputing with the scribes and his disciples. So humankind all throughout the Bible, we read how, you know, we're like, hey, God, yay, God. And then it's like, wait, I'm distracted by something shiny or I'm just kind of in my little comfort zone and I'm not yay, God again. And, you know, I need that oomph. So for Jesus to have to say this to them again, it's like, hey, focus, stay with me. This is what's going to happen. You got to get ready. It said he began to teach them in 831, which, you know, we were in last season, very last episode of last season. And here it says he was teaching his disciples, saying to them. So, I mean, it's as a teacher, you don't ever just teach things once. You do try to review and Mm -hmm. You know, make sure that things sink in. And we see this throughout all the Gospels, Jesus continually telling this. And, you know, as Christians living in the century we do, we do kind of tend to be like, why don't they see it? Like, it's very easy. Hindsight's twenty twenty. It's very easy for us to see it. And, you know, for them, they were living it. And I'm sure, I mean, I know there are concepts like tying my shoes, which is pretty simple it's not understanding the plan that Jesus, that God set forth from the foundations of the earth. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> it took me more than one lesson to get tying my shoes. So, I mean, I can <laughs> extend grace there for sure. But I just think, you know, sometimes we do kind of beat them up. And sometimes we beat ourselves up when people don't get things right away. And that's kind of the point I was trying to draw out. Like, Jesus was the best teacher anyone could ever have. And people didn't understand it. And that was part of God's, you know, providence there because we know we've talked about this before, you know, even Peter rebuking him. It's like, I would never let that happen. But obviously it had to happen. But yeah, so, um, but I think about how a lot of people, I would say most of the people at, at this time, We're looking for a Messiah that was coming in the likes of Daniel 7. You know, the triumphant king with all power and dominion. And they had this idea of what he was going to be like. And Jesus came 
is as a suffering servant from Isaiah 53, and he was poor, and he didn't have what we would consider the power that humans think of. Right. Um, and technically, he would have that power. He just didn't exercise that authority. But it would be very easy to misunderstand that. I mean, if you were thinking, because in our mind, those two things are mutually exclusive. Like, there, there's no way you can be a suffering servant and have all dominion over the world. Like, that's just, right. no. And so, I mean, it's it's easy to see where they could misunderstand that and misapply the scripture, the word of God that they would have known. Just like for us, sometimes that's easy to do as well. I was saying, you know, we don't extend grace to people. Sometimes we're like, oh, they don't understand. And and they're thinking of certain scriptures and none of it contradicts, but they're not connecting all the dots. They just need some more time. And eventually the disciples do get it. Obviously Jesus dies and is risen risen, (laughs) and they go on to do many great things um, in his name. Verses, so 33 through 50. You know, he, you talked about him being a teacher. You know he's teaching them as they're going from town to town. So they have this exclusive time with him, even though there could have been more than the 12, you know. But he's teaching them this whole time. They went from um, Caesarea Philippi. So now in verse 33, they're in Capernaum. Mm-hmm. And um, he asks, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? This is what you mentioned last yeah. episode of this. Um, but look what he is. He's the mediator. Oh, yeah. He's about to, okay, what did you say? What did you say? And and he just got finished telling them, I'm going to be killed and raised. And here they are. And that's a huge thing. You would think with all the walking they were doing, like the little trip they were making. Mm-hmm. They would have been chewing on that. Yeah. But no. No. (laughs) (laughs) But no, they did not. But what I love is that he waited till he got to the house to ask them. Yeah, not in front of Which sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he does it out in public and takes care of things in the open. And then sometimes he waits. I wrote down he used this as a teachable moment. He Mm -hmm. really did, which that's kind of what he does. But can you see, like, look at verse 34. But they kept silent. Yep. (laughs) Like, like That's children. what my kids do. <laughs> like, like, what are you doing? And they just stare at you. Mm-hmm. Like, they know they did something. You know, I thought maybe Peter, James, and John, they saw the transfiguration. Maybe the others were telling Peter, you know, hey, he had to rebuke you. Yeah, we know you went up on the mountain, but he rebuked you, saying, get behind me, Satan. Or, or maybe the others could have been disputing, saying, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't heal that boy, you know. They ain't no telling what they were disputing. Honestly, they could have been disputing again, like who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, or whatever the case was. Obviously, Jesus needed to mediate that situation. Yeah. And you know, thirty-five through thirty-seven, the point Jesus makes is, you know, he he takes this child amongst them, and you know, he's telling them to be. Like like this child. So he's telling them to be pure and innocent and full of all things good, you know, not envy or strife or division or comparing yourself to another or, you know, kids look up to their parents as to the ones who take care of them. And he's telling the disciples, you know, correcting them with this dispute. If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and the servant of all. Then he took the child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. So it's like, be like this child. This child is only dependent on whoever takes care of him. But Jesus was countercultural here by telling, you know, treating a child the way he did and kind of putting a child up as an example because children were thought less of back then, children. And we see that in other accounts where, like, children are running up to him and the disciples are shooing them away. And he's like, no, no, let the children come to me. And Jesus does this with women. I mean, all these populations that were mistreated and um, kind of cast to the side. Jesus continues to do that. But if you look at, like, James one twenty seven, it says that pure religion... Mm-hmm. Is to help the 
visit and help the widows and the orphans. And those would have been people that needed help, but society would have overlooked. Like they were without the protection of a man because back then that is who was, you know, kind of. The heads of families. Well, the, yeah, the heads of families, but the per- that would be who had all the rights and who, who was able to have, you know, privileges, but also um, protections and that kind of thing. And so there weren't protections on the Jewish law. They were afforded those, but you had to have family. And so Jesus kind of does what he always does, where he's very radical and he just takes care of things in a way that nobody else does. And he's taking this child and he's putting it in here and not only, he's giving it a place of honor, this child. And so he's saying, you know, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. You know, which in other accounts he, you know, says, be like this child. Mm -hmm. But here he's, you know, he's basically, because receiving is more than just, you know, allowing them to be in your presence. Receiving would, you know, uh, involve some level of responsibility and hospitality toward the, the children. And we don't think about the place of honor being service, but that's what Jesus is saying here. If you're to be first and you're to be the, because they're discussing who's the greatest, to be the greatest, you have to be a servant. And Jesus, you know, we think of it opposite, like the master is the leader and the servant is menial. But Jesus is saying, no, leadership equals service. And to us, that's kind of a contradiction, but Mm -hmm. to Jesus it isn't. And it does make sense. And we know, you know, from, what is it, James? 317. 317. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. I love that verse. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. And I can't ever seem to remember which verse exactly it is. <laughs> um, they talked in Acts about, you know, those who have turned the world upside down, which we're just following Christ who turns everything, all of our thinking on its head. Yeah. Anyway, I found it funny that the next chunk of verses, 38 through 41, it says, Now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. John, is he just changing the whole subject? Does he want to avoid, you know, does he want to avoid the this whole rebuke, you know, yeah. from the mediator? It, he's, and then to bring up this, is, was he jealous of this person uh, able I'm, to do this? I wrote that down, like, why jump? I changed subjects, and yeah. then, but Jesus brings it back uh-huh. to that. I kind of wonder if maybe John's like, okay, okay, we we messed up. Let's let's change the subject, <laughs> shall we? You know, let hey hey Jesus, look, this guy's doing this, and you know Jesus explains about that, but then goes right back to hey, mm-hmm. let me bring you back to what I was saying originally, maybe. Yeah, and I think I love verse forty one. I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. And, I mean, my heading there in the ESV says anyone not against us is for us. And I think we struggle with that, especially in the church. Um, We want to discredit good deeds done by people that aren't members of our body. And, I mean, this is, I am so glad I'm not the judge. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we aren't called to judge. We're called to preach the judgments or teach the judgments and then step back and let the word work because the word works more than we ever could, no matter we're just spinning our wheels sometimes. I mean, we're obviously involved. We are called to evangelize and to show people Christ's love. I mean, hence this whole podcast. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I know, especially growing up, I saw that a lot. Like, well, it doesn't matter that they did that because they're wrong. Yeah. And that's not true. I mean, God still rewards people for doing those things. I mean, it doesn't necessarily say what the reward is here. I mean, I don't know that that's up to us to imply what the reward is here, whether that, you know, just be blessings on this earth or in the life to come or what. I mean, we do know, obviously, that only those who love God and follow his word and live life accordingly are going to receive eternal life. That's what the Bible teaches. Yeah. But I mean, that's not our place to step in. And I think that's kind of, I mean, obviously I think that's what he's getting at here. Yeah. This is a definite, this is definitely a don't judge moment. Mm-hmm. You know, like you said, where people don't come here. They go to Matthew. Right. Seven. 
Yeah, but I mean, he's telling him, you know, this is not for you, basically, to figure out or to judge. You know? Right, that's above your pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the reward, like you said, we don't know what that reward is, but who's to say that in doing so, they won't eventually receive the reward of salvation? Right. You see what I'm saying? Like, it could yeah. be, I'm not saying, okay, they give you a cup of water, oh, you're saved. No, it's not that. It's, yeah. it's, it, they gave you that cup of water because of who you follow, right? Because that's what he right. says there. Yeah. And you, they do it in my name because you belong to Christ. So if they're coming to you because you belong to Christ and they just give you a little cup of water, then who's to say that won't evolve into learning more about Christ because they Origin came to you for being right. And that, I mean, we, we went through the parable of the soils last season. Yeah. You know, and I think, I mean, God and Jesus know the hearts of man, and we mm-hmm. do not. But a lot of times we want to, even with this, like, ascribe motive behind things sometimes, or we want to overlook motive when it is a good motive. You know, the Bible has things to say about that for sure. But I think we focus entirely too much on that when we could be looking at the soil and saying, like, look at this heart mm-hmm. and look what it wants to do. And it it is open-minded. It's mm-hmm. an open-minded heart <laughs> for something, an organ. Yeah. I don't mean it that way. I'm sure you all know what I mean. <laughs> but look at this soul, this beautiful soul that is seeking to do good. And what he's saying here is, like, don't discourage those people from doing good just because they're not in your basically in your house, so to speak. Yeah, or in a circle. Yeah, in your circle. Mm-hmm. And it, we could definitely learn that lesson, I think, and apply it and do better as the church yeah, from that. So like you said, he kind of skips back to where he was before and talks about, you know, those who cause one of these little ones to stumble or to sin. It would be better for you if... You were basically killed. Yeah. That's... Than it would be to lead someone astray, which I know seems really drastic to some people. But I mean, here's the thing when you're doing that, two souls are lost. It's double the loss. So, I mean, it just even if you just look at it purely mathematically, he, you know, he brings their attention back to being pure, you know, with the, the child. So, you know, he says to get rid of the temptation that you know from experience will cause you to sin, right? Look at the examples, though, that he uses. So in 43, if your hand makes you sin, cut it off. You know, it bedded it into life maim. In 45, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Enter life lame. In 47, if your eye makes you sin, pluck it out. You know, enter the kingdom with one eye. Those are all specific miracles, he performed. They are. He healed the lame man, the man with the withered hand in the synagogue. He healed the lame man that was lowered through the roof. Mm-hmm. And the, the eye with the blind people. Yeah. That jumped out at me. That's this really time. cool. Isn't it? So it's interesting. And his disciples would have seen these miracles. So he's saying, hey. And obviously yeah, he values those things. He took the time to heal those people. Mm-hmm. And he's saying, like, the opposite almost, like, those things aren't worth it right. if they're going to keep you from, or if they're going to send you to hell. Mm-hmm. I can make you whole. Right. I'm the only one, because those are right. miracles I've said before, specific to him that were prophesied he was only able to do. And he would also be saying here, you can be whole without those things. It's more what he's saying here is the emphasis is spiritual. Mm-hmm. Spiritual wholeness is worth a whole lot more than physical wholeness. But to see, it's up to us. He doesn't say he's going to cut it out. We, we have to cut it out. So yeah. you pluck your eye out. You cut your hand off. You cut your foot off. You have to do that first. I have to do that first before he can heal me and make me whole. Right. Well, we have to show that we want it mm-hmm. and that we're willing to work for it too, I think. And we can't earn our salvation, but it's right. conditional. It's conditional on us. I think we can ask ourselves, you know, what do I struggle with? And that's something we should be, you know, constantly evaluating ourselves and not being like the man in James who walks away 
you know, from the mirror are no different. Right. And then the follow-up question to that would be, what in my life encourages me to pursue that? You know, what are my sin triggers? I think we need to know those. You know, what's encouraging me to sin? And sometimes that's a that's things. Sometimes that's attitudes. Sometimes that's people. And whatever those triggers are, we need to remove them. And I think, which makes me think about like Hezekiah in Second Kings 18, where it talks about him removing the high places. Oh, yeah. You know, when you get rid of those things, I used to joke about that, you know, when I'd go on a diet, like, yeah, I'm on a diet, but I haven't removed the high places, which would be like <laughs> the Cheetos or, you know, <laughs> the, the Oreos. place of worship. Yeah. yeah my um, Oreos. But I think that we can, we can ask ourselves another question that parallels with that, and that's, what do I need to add in my life to encourage the godliness? And I think about that, where Jesus talks in Matthew 12, in Luke 11 about the the demon leaving and the man setting the house right. Yeah. And it's not just enough to get rid of the bad things. You have to put good things in so that they don't come back in full force and bring seven however much times with, yeah, worse. Yeah. Seven times worse, whatever it is. And sometimes that, you know, the what is a who? Who do I add in my life? Mm-hmm. You know, who's my Paul? Who's my... Barnabas. Barnabas. Who's going to help me get to heaven, you know, and we have to make sure, sorry, I keep adding things as I think of them um, (laughs) or have notes about them, but maybe this is the flip side instead of the other part. We can't be the person who's encouraging that. And sometimes we think of that as proactively being like, here, take a drink, which I'm not tempted by alcohol. I have people in my family that are tempted by that and drugs and you know, sometimes it's not saying here, here's these pills or here's this substance, whatever it is. Sometimes it's saying things like, oh, well, that's just whoever, like insert name here. That's just D. That's just what she does. Yeah. That's just how she is. Oh, that's just. She's always been like that. Bert. Yeah. That's just Ernie. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the Sesame Street character. Um, but I mean, I've been places where it's like that. And that, that kind of attitude encourages ungodliness. And we've got to make sure that we aren't doing that for other people. We aren't excusing the sin for them. When you look at 1 Corinthians where Paul is talking to them in chapter 5, he's like, oh, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. This is not a good situation. And then they take it too far in 2 Corinthians. It needs to be corrected. (laughs) But, I mean, you know, we've got to make sure that we've got that balance there and that we're um, doing everything it takes, making every effort, you know, to be who we need to be, but also encouraging other people to be who they need to be. And that was a very long comment. I apologize for the link there. Uh, Do you have anything to add to that? No. Surely you do. (laughs) That's it. Oh, good. But he wraps it up there. Talking about salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. I love how it goes back really to where we started, have peace with one another. Mm-hmm. When we started this, they were bickering. They well, they were discussing yeah. something petty. He's saying, you know, be salt, you know, which takes you back to Matthew, be the salt of the earth. You know, in 49, he says, for everyone will be seasoned with fire. And I can never understand that. Yeah, and that is something I'm still working on, I mean, figuring thing out I can what he means right think there. think of is like... Which mine says salted with fire, but... Well, yeah. Yeah, so, but I mean, same thing. Is it, I don't know, is it like the char? You know how when you fire something and you get the char, it's got that good flavor to it, you know? And yeah, I, and I fire, know. too, throughout Scripture is um, a way of purifying gold or silver. Right. It, to make it pure. Because when you get silver or gold out of the ground, it's not pure. It has to be going through the fire. Right, it has in order. to be refined. Yeah. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. It has to be refined. The, there's the cutting off of the hand. There's the plucking out of the eye. There's the, you know, fire he run, puts us through to get rid of that, to make us pure. Right. You know, because he's talking about getting rid of these things. So everyone who's seasoned with fire or salted with fire... New King James adds a little more to that verse. I don't know if 
ESV has it, but it says, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. The next verse is salt is good, and if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Salt is used to preserve, you know, it adds flavor to food. It's used to cleanse. Yeah, and it was either also even used for um, certain healings. Right. You know, there's something to that. If you've lost it, how are you going to be salty again? You know, not salty in the, you know. Yeah, in the what we would call salty now. Yeah. <laughs> really, I do think that that is where it's, where it's driving at home. Um, right in verse 48 says, where their, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mm-hmm. And then it goes on to say, for everyone will be salted with fire. The fires that we go through in this life eventually will be quenched. There will be an end to the suffering. But if we don't make the right choices, there will just be new suffering after that. Obviously, there's something. I mean, salt also burns when, you know, when placed with ice on your skin, make a salt burn. Yeah. And also, when you're in the ocean, salt gets in your eyes. It burns your eyes, and mm-hmm. not for any good reason. It's not like it's cleansing there. The salt water also makes my hair look awesome <laughs> when I get it in there. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, but I mean, you know, I says salt is good. And yeah. to have salt um, in yourselves, have peace. Right. Something we need, that's our part in it. Yeah. Not that this, we save ourselves, like you said. But it's still, we still have a responsibility right. in our souls, in our faith, in our yeah. walk with Christ wondered for a long time, like, why is that there? Mm -hmm. Because he's talking about hell. And then he says, everyone will be salted with fire. We know everyone won't be in hell. Um, We're promised that if we're faithful, we'll get to be in heaven. And so I think here, I really do think that the fire is trials. Um, I'm trying to think of the verse. And you know, trials make us stronger when we keep our faith. Yeah, they refine us. The fire will either not be quenched or it'll purify us. The right. salt will either burn and not be quenched, or it'll preserve us. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, let's look for the love of Christ. Where do you see the love of Christ? Do you know? I see it in several verses, but it's um, verses 31, 35, and 37, and then 39 and 40. And I see it in his determination to keep our focus on him. Like He just really wants for us to... You know, it's almost like he's waving, hey, look here, look over here by me. <laughs> so, yeah, I see it in his determination to keep our focus on him. I see it in just how he's a teacher and how he uses all the teachable moments. And like I mentioned before, he is the most compassionate, wise. I mean, he's the best teacher that could have ever existed. And people didn't necessarily understand him all the time. And people were afraid to ask him questions. And it wasn't because of any failing on his part. It's just kind of how we are as humans. Sometimes we're afraid to ask. But I see that example, and it encourages me greatly, you know, especially as a mom <laughs> and a homeschool mom. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. All right. Well, that's episode two in season three. So thank you again for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments, please um, send us a message either through our Facebook group page or through our Instagram. We would love to hear from you. Um, We would love to study with you too. Or if we can't study with you, we'll connect you to someone local to you. As always, we hope that you will seek to know the love of Christ in your life. can reach out to us on Facebook or Instagram. We would love to hear from you. And be sure to click like and share this episode with family and friends. In doing so, you're sharing the love of Christ.